I'm not gonna lie, I'm not a very big fan of the whole short hair look, but I think this turned out pretty good. So, Madame Bovary. The author is French, so if I'm not pronouncing his name correctly, feel free to tell me how I'm supposed to pronounce it. Because all I'm getting is, I'm gonna guess it's pronounced Gustave Flaubert. I hope that's correct, but I thought Gustave was more of a German name. Oh well. What is the basic story? The story opens up in an elementary school, where this one kid that's about like eight years old than everybody, kind of shows that he's smart, but has a hard time listening. So he gets the dunce chair every so often. All of a sudden, the story kind of jumps to who this kid is and who their parents are. The kid's name is Charles Bovary. His father was a retired war veteran who was able to get quite a lot of money from it. He liked having an expensive taste, but started to find that it was eating out his budget, so he wanted his son to have a really good career so he could have him to go off of. His mother... They never really give a name, they just call her Madame Bovary Senior. We'll get to why they call her Bovary Senior in a moment. We don't really get a whole lot about her, except that she's kind of a control freak. She wanted her son to become a doctor, and that's exactly what he did. We skip on ahead about probably 15 years, I wager, when his mother tells him, you should take a wife, and so he does. This is Madame Bovary Junior, I guess would be the term. She is about 30 years older than she is, has a face like the moon, full of craters, and has a personality to match her exterior beauty. But she is loaded! So Charles is kind of able to get into a higher echelon there, as well as get some better clientele with his doctoring. She only stays married to this Madame Bovary for about three years before she just mysteriously drops dead by simply saying, Oh, I'm going. That's it. Alone in the house, Charles just focuses all his attention onto his doctor skills. He is called to a farm. A mysterious Rualt is the name of the owner. Once again, I don't know French, so if I'm not pronouncing that right, please tell me how I'm supposed to do so. Now you might think, hmm, owns a farm, probably not that big of a business, but no, he is loaded and that farm is massive. While Charles is there helping reseat his broken leg, he by chance bumps into his lovely daughter named Emma, who that is the woman that's portrayed on the cover here. I'll explain my general interpretation of this later. So after a few years, to just kind of satisfy the whole mourning the loss of the first Madame Bovary, which, let's be honest, he did not miss her one bit, he then asks Emma's hand in marriage, and it seems like they both are about to live happily after. However, this is not the case. While Charles is madly in love with Emma, Emma has just simply become disillusioned. She had all these high expectations of what love was supposed to be about, what a manly man was supposed to be, somebody who would go out on the hunt, getting the bar fights to be able to defend her honor, playing bridge with all the guys, stuff like that. And Charles just seems like kind of a dud to her because he doesn't do any of that. He basically just does doctoring on the side, comes home, kisses her all over, and that's it. At first, Emma was kind of enchanted by this, but eventually learned to hate this because it just wasn't exciting. She was hoping that Prince Charming would come by and rescue her from that fabled castle, but turns out all she got was Prince Charming's stable boy. With this, she slowly goes into depression, to which Charles wonders why, because he is just madly in love with her. He is a very faithful husband. He does everything that she wants, that she needs. There is one event that honestly helps out a fair bit. So, one of Charles's wealthy clientele hosts a masquerade ball, to which Emma is just loving it. This idea of being able to live in a castle, to be able to enjoy all these fancy foods and all these other things. 
these were the kind of things she thought she'd be marrying into when she was told she was going to be marrying a doctor. However, after that party, it's back to boring life again, and she just goes into a deep, thorough depression. Charles, seeing that she's not getting any better, figures, let's move to a different town. To which she is hopeful that she's going to go to Paris or some other big city where it's just going to be fantastic. A lot of crazy things are going to be happening. But instead, they move to a very small town known as Yonville. Now, the town they originally started in was called Totst. Once again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing these right. I'm not French. Okay, well, technically, but let's not go there. And Yonville is just the rinkiest, dinkiest little podunk there is in France. You basically have, like, the same ten people there that just kind of get a little older, maybe have a kid or two, and that's it. Now, before starting this journey, it is found out that Emma is pregnant. Emma was really so hoping that she would give birth to a son, kind of as a way to be able to rebel against the patriarchy a bit. The idea that she feels trapped as a woman. She just can't go around and have fun. She has to be faithful to her husband. The subservient, obedient wife just has to be happy all the time. But to her great dismay, turns out she has a daughter. By this time, they moved into Yonville, and they named their daughter Birth. She liked the name because it was one of the people she met at that great masquerade ball. The depression seems to get a little worse for a few more days, until she meets a very exciting character known as Leon. A very young lawyer who has aspirations to be able to go to the big city and kind of has a few occasions, and Emma just eats this up, as she just wants something in her life, and this is that something. For a while, it seemed like they were almost going to have a bit of an affair, but after rumors started to circulate around the town that Emma's character was being disintegrated, she kind of puts up this face of being the subservient, obedient wife, but slowly is just being eaten inside because she can't stand Charles anymore. She never really figured out if Leon ever bought into this act or not, but unfortunately he has to leave town to pursue his lawyering career. She goes into devastation, and it seems like she is just getting very, very sick by the day to the point where she's coughing up blood. Charles is very concerned by this, but Emma just doesn't care. She just doesn't really see any point in living anymore. Until she runs into another exotic character known as Rodolphe. Once again, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Now, he went in with the intention that he wanted to have a full-on affair with this woman. He starts very subtly. There's a great agricultural show. And he just kind of starts with saying, Hmm, you know, you're very beautiful. Would you like to go on a vacation or do other things? Just small things like that. Until it gets to a point where they're just kind of sleeping together once a week. The only problem is, Rodolphe has had a lot of other mistresses before, and Emma all of a sudden starts developing feelings for him. And he doesn't want that. He just wants a plaything with every so often, instead of, well, a wife. He just wants friends with benefits. So they kind of plan this idea of taking this trip to Paris. And Emma is just chomping at the bit to be able to get out of this stinking town. However, this is where Rodolphe breaks it off. He sends a letter basically saying, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. I'm destroying your life, destroying your husband, yada, yada, yada. Really what he's just saying is, Look, I didn't want to actually love you. I just wanted to have fun with you. And then with that, he leaves. And Emma is basically brought to the verge of suicide. She's about to go up to the topmost area of her building and jump. However, Charles is able to convince her to come down. This right here starts the biggest depression that she ever had in her life. She is basically bedridden. And everybody thought she was going to die. The church even kind of gives her last rites even. And she kind of finds solace in the idea of the faith. But this doesn't last for very long and she kind of perks up pretty quickly. Charles is recommended that 
he takes Emma to a play just outside of Paris, just as a way to be able to break up the monotony, as well as to focus her attention on something else rather than simply hating her life and everything. She does this, and it was just like the Masquerade Ball all over again. She is just lost in this play and simply loving it. But even more interesting is she bumps into her old flame, Leon. Emma and Leon meet up a lot in this city. Emma goes under the disguise that she's going there to take piano lessons with him. But instead, she's going to this lavish hotel and just loving each other. Just a little break to be able to enjoy living again rather than just being that subservient, obedient wife. This goes on for quite a while, and unfortunately she starts to drain most of Charles's assets, to which she is just taking debt on and on and on, to the point where she just can't pay for anything anymore. Before it got too dire, Leon had to break it off with Emma. He's up for a big promotion in the idea of being around with Emma, which is up for a big promotion in the idea of being around with Emma, which is the equivalent of being around with a whore by her reputation. He just had to break it off. She is once again heartbroken, but this is on top of crippling debt. A few days after the breakup, she goes to anybody she knows to be able to get a loan, an extension, a little something to be able to keep going. And she thinks one more time of Rodolfi. She somehow gets his address. I don't really know. I mean, the letter that Rodolfi sent to Emma in the first place was very unspecific. It was just, I have to go now. So where in the world did Emma get his address? She begs and pleads with him to be able to get the money. To which he says, I don't have it. Emma just lets through all her fury about being left there to just suffer, as well as just looking around all the expensive trinkets, saying, hmm, you men certainly have it tough. When you're poor, you only have silver gilded guns. You only have partially fine china. You have all these other extravagant gifts. I've got nothing. How dare you say you don't have the money? You owe me this. But Rodolphe just simply says, eh, too bad, so sad. And with this, Emma just can't stand it anymore. She goes to the local pharmacist and takes arsenic in order to kill herself. This right here is probably the most disturbing thing I have ever read. And probably the closest I've ever come to crying over a book. So she takes the arsenic and they go into very graphic detail about what arsenic does to the body. She says there's a section in the middle where all of a sudden she just starts feeling numb and she's like, oh, it's finally working. <laughs> However, her body just starts rejecting it. She's throwing up all over the place and Charles is just like, okay, what did you eat? There's like white powder all over this puke. That is not something that is natural. Now that night, Emma wrote a letter, a suicide note, you could say. This is one of the things that bugs me is that we never actually get to read this letter. All we ever get is that Emma took arsenic, and that is why she is dying. It slowly starts to eat her away, and then on her deathbed, you can just see this nice, serene look on somebody that just doesn't have problems anymore. It's the idea that in death, she is free. In life, she is in slavery. Charles is just utterly devastated by this, and... Wow. I mean, even just recalling it now, I'm almost kind of feeling some tears welling up, but you really get the idea about how much Charles really misses her. He basically just goes into these same emotional depressions that Emma went through when she just couldn't live life anymore. He just exists. However, Charles being madly in love with her, even to the grave, still gives her the funeral that she deserves. She is given... Three coffins, as well as green silk in order to cover her up. Everybody, including his mother, which is still alive, is saying, you are wasting your money on somebody who doesn't deserve it. But Charles doesn't care. He's beside himself. And he just has to figure out how to say goodbye to the only thing that he ever loved. Several weeks passed. 
and Charles visits the grave one last time. The daughter, Berth, is probably about six years old at this point and decides to call Daddy in to say that it's time for dinner. Even though they're in crippling debt, they still have servants at the house. I don't get how that works either. But as Charles is sitting there by the grave, it just looks like he is staring intently when Berth decides to just give him a little push, to which he falls down. Dead. With this, Berth is orphaned, and is later given off to Madame Bovary Sr. She is able to stay at that house for about three years before she died, and then started to live with another obscure aunt somewhere in the country. She is very much alive and well, but she will probably never escape this poverty that just kind of hung over her entire life. And, uh, yeah, that, that's how the book ends. When it comes to the pacing of this book... It feels a lot like watching, say, Lawrence of Arabia with somebody that has no patience. They just keep hitting the fast forward button. They just kind of keep skipping ahead months, years, giving basic summaries for certain things. But there are a few times where that person has to go to the bathroom and the story actually plays out the way it should. There is one section in here, aside from the very end, that I actually really loved. So there's this one person in town called Hippolyte, I want to say. He was born with a club foot. I'm not really sure what that means, and quite frankly, I don't want to look it up. But essentially, you can't walk on it very well. Charles read in a medical journal about how to be able to fix that, and so he tries to. But unfortunately, the procedure leaves the foot infected, and then an important doctor from the big city has to come in and then amputate it. This really has no bearing on the story, and from the preface, there are certain additions that even just outright omit this section, but why would you do that? That's like one of the best sections of the book, in my opinion. Aside from the very end, of course. In general, though, it's a very hard book to recommend, because I have a feeling in the 1800s when this book came out, it must have been a very radical and scandalous book. The idea that, like, what? Women actually lust for people? They want to be more than just the subservient wife to do all the wifely duties? That's blasphemous. And even there's one character in it which is kind of against the church. Not so much like today with all these atheists we have, but it's just kind of like, wait, wait a minute. Why in the world do we need to donate thousands of dollars to something when we can just pray to God? And what's the point of praying if they're already saved or not saved? To which the priest just basically keeps going to this character, uh, shut up. It must have been pretty radical at the time. As well as the idea of it being a story about infidelity. Given that, this must have been quite a hot seller back in the day. But in this day and age, stories about infidelity are a dime a dozen. And plus... Most people usually go to the idea of Great Gatsby as being one of the greatest stories about infidelity, so it almost kind of leaves Madame Bovary outmoded, so to speak. Would I recommend it? I really can't. In all honesty, this book was just a slog to get through. Like, the only reason I kept reading it is because I just wanted to be done with it already. I just wasn't very excited, and plus in general, I'm just not a big fan of love stories. And plus, this is one of the crazy things, after reading Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, I love the idea that not a lot happens in that book, but yet the characters in it are so live and entertaining. Just having them sitting at a table talking was enough to be entertaining. This right here, it's more like the narrator just saying, oh yeah, they said they were kind of upset by this and then went to bed. Well, if it was Dostoevsky, it'd be more like he got up from the table. How dare you, good sir, I have been offended by your cruel comments. I give my glove to you. To which the other guy just goes, well, I'm going to bed. See the difference? That's a lot more interesting than this. It just feels like it gives you the bare essentials. Which is really weird at the same time, because a lot of people love this book because for every subject Gustav didn't know about, he did massive research on. 
oh, a club foot. Well, I better read all these medical journals to know what that means and how you treat it. Oh, uh, infidelity. Let's see. What cases do we have here? Uh Uh-huh. Very good. How in the world do women's dresses work? How does horseback riding work? The guy did so much research for this book, but yet it doesn't come across that way. It just comes across as somebody saying that they read all this and then giving a very basic summary. I wasn't too big a fan of this book. There were actually some passages that I found a little too relatable. I will read those for you. Leon was tired of being in love without results. He began feeling the despondency brought on by the unvarying repetition of the same life. When there is no motivating interest and no sustaining hope, he was so bored with the Anvil and the Anvilites that the sight of certain people in certain houses irritated beyond endurance. And the pharmacist, as friendly as he was, seemed to have become absolutely unbearable. Yet the prospect of a new situation frightened him as much as it tempted him. At first she was in a state of confusion. She saw the trees, the paths, the ditches. Rodolphe and she still feel the tightness of his embrace while the leaves rustled and the reeds whistled. But when she saw her reflection in the mirror, she was astounded at her appearance. Her eyes had never been so large, so black, nor of such depth. She was transfigured by some subtle change permeating her entire being. She kept telling herself, I have a lover, a lover, relishing the thought like that of some unexpected second puberty. So she was finally going to possess those joys of love, the fever of happiness, of which she had so long despaired. She was entering into something marvelous where all would be passion, ecstasy, delirium. She was enveloped in a vast expanse of blue, the peaks of emotion sparkling in her thoughts. Ordinary existence seemed to be in the distance, down below in the shadows between the peaks. So there were people that liked puberty the first time? Maybe that's just because of my experience, but I wouldn't want to go through that again. Although I will admit, the second puberty I'm going through is not only perfectly described in this passage, but I am loving it. The last thing I will end on is the cover. Usually when it comes to the cover of the book, I like to figure out what it's supposed to be depicting. What, is it like a specific scene, a specific character? There's a lot that you can get from the cover. And I think this cover really encapsulates what this book is all about. Obviously, this is Madame Bovary, the third technically. It's not the mother, and it's not the pimple-faced rich brat. That is how they very much describe Emma. And I think up here is what she wished she was in her imagination. But yet this is the cold exterior that anybody ever wanted from her. And thus, that's all she ever gave. Maybe that's another reason I don't really like this book. It really shows how much better being a woman is in this time in history. But I think it just hits close to home because all anybody ever wanted me to be was just the quiet, subservient person. That was back when I was born as a man, so how in the world does that work? So yeah, that's Madame Bovary. This is probably going to be the last book review I'm going to do for a while. It's not so much I'm getting burned out, it's just... I want to spend less time reading, and I want to play more video games. And it seems like I can't really do both. If I am going to read again, I'm either going to go back to the epic of Middle-earth, or I'm going to go back to the epic of Ayn's dystopian future. Both of which I've already reviewed on this channel, so it might be a while before the next book review comes out. But I can definitely say I'm probably leaning a little more towards Tolkien myself. But if you enjoyed this series so far, I do hope that you'll join me for whenever that next book review comes to flourishing. Until next time, keep having fun.